this this audience has done more for the Elixir community. We know him as Bruce Tate. But how many of you know that he is also a kayaker, which is evident from his Twitter profile picture, a climber, and also an author. Bruce is also a father of two and lives in Tennessee, USA. The author of more than a dozen books, some of which are well known to you, such as Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, Adopting Elixir, there are just there, there are many. Thank you, Bruce, for sharing your knowledge with the programming world. Bruce is evidently active in the Elixir community as a speaker, an author, an editor, and a conference organizer. He is also a serial entrepreneur and has helped start three companies. He has most recently served as CTO for I Can Make It Better. His love for teaching and computer languages led him to found Groxio in 2018. Um, so just a short notice, a kind short notice. We apologize for any technical hitches we might experience during the webinar. And kindly note, we will be recording the session for those who will be unfortunate as not to attend to access it on YouTube. So try as much as you can to resist the urge to hit the stop record button. And before I forget, stay connected. You don't want to miss Bruce's special giveaway. Let's hear what Bruce has to say about building programs in LAS. Bruce, take it away. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. It is great to be here. Um, I've been to just just three continents, and you know, maybe we'll we'll have after this pandemic is over, we'll find a way to get together. So I would um, like that very much. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see what I'm seeing? Yes. Yeah. yeah looks good. Okay. Great. So. I'm here to talk with you today about building um, scalable systems, and um, the, the this this is a book that I wrote with a pragmatic bookshelf, and it's really it comes my role in this book comes after about a year of or real well maybe six or seven months of um, of an attempt by James Gray to write such a book by himself. It it turns out that that James is a um, is a brilliant man, one of my best friends, and um, and really um, a tremendous tactician, if you will, and a great strat uh, a great strategist that understands programming languages very very well. But um, <clears throat> sometimes when you know too much, writing a book is hard because. Because when you know too much, you try to say too much with every sentence. So I jumped onto this team and really gave the book. Um, you know, I, I tried to let James provide most of the technical knowledge in the book, and I tried to give the the book a um, a voice and a um, kind of a an overall organization and um, to focus James's thoughts, but. Um, but this is mostly his vision, so I want to um, I want to thank him for that, and um, hope that he gets to hear this talk. So most people say that love can't be measured. I believe it can be measured, <laughs> not really. But um, I would love it if you um, if we could connect online. Um, I am Red Rapids. Um, you know, I, I heard you mention that I'm a kayaker. Yes, I'm a kayaker. And I had a big red bright kayak, and so that's my why my Twitter handle is called Red Rapids. So follow me, and um, and we'll keep up after this um, presentation is over. So my company is called Groxio Learning, and I wanted to talk talk just a second about that. So if you look at the word Grox, it's kind of like the word Grok, G R O K, mean meaning I understand it, I intuitively get it. And grox meaning um, somebody who grok who can grok something, and if you look at the I O, that's a one and a zero. So it's almost like that's a computer language, and that you're intuitively understanding a computer language. And it's also a really short URL that I like to type. 
So before we get started about the designing Elixir systems with OTP, um, I wanted to sneak in this first little section and you in Kenya um, will be the first to ever see it. So this is my, um, my quick view of OTP. So let's say that you have this process and maybe you want to implement a tiny service. I heard someone mention this morning that they were writing microservices with Elixir. So we're going to call this process a server and then say, maybe you want to make this, this server, um, the API that you build for the server generic in some way. So then we have this generic server, this gen server. And then let's say that it's time to start that service. So your application starts the gen server. Well, there's a problem here because that server can go away. There are a number of reasons that it could die. And then the service is sad, the application is sad, everybody is sad. So I want to tell you a little bit about Joe Armstrong. Joe Armstrong was a good friend of mine. I heard someone mention the book Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. Well, when I wrote that book, um, I actually wrote the chapters for, for Prologue and Erlang first before any of the other ones. And my editor knew Joe and sent them without my knowledge to, to Joe to be reviewed. <laughs> so she sent my first attempt at Erlang to Joe Armstrong, and she also sent his favorite language, Prologue, to be reviewed. Well, anyway, I did a pretty good job of Erlang that made him happy. I did a terrible job with Prologue and that made him sad. And um, so he took me under his wing and Joe helped me learn um, a little bit more about Prologue. And then through hanging out with him um, over the years, I learned a little bit about OTP. But the whole idea of OTP, it's called an, an open, it's, it used to be called the Open Telecom Platform, but that was too confusing. So um, it's not called anything right now, which I think is more confusing because now you have the, the initials OTP without a name that goes with it. So to me, it's still the Open Telecom Platform, so I can remember Joe. But this is how he solved that problem. He said your application shouldn't start a generic server. Well, it should start a generic server, but this ge generic server isn't the one that you built to build your service. Instead, it's a process server or a lifecycle server. It knows how to start and stop other servers, right? And when we're saying server here, I don't use the word as something that is on a network. I use the word server as something that is, um, oh, perhaps a process or perhaps on another node, or maybe it's on another service, but I use it as a generic way to manage a microservice. So in OTP land, we call this thing a supervisor. But when you say, when you see the word supervisor from this point on in your whole long life, I don't want you to see the word supervisor. I want you to see the word life cycle because life cycles are really what OTP is all about. When you know how to start something clean, when you know how to stop it cleanly, and when you can detect that another service has failed, you can take action like this. So my application starts the supervisor, the supervisor starts my generic server, which can be a game or a web session or an embedded app if you're using NERVs, you know, web session for Phoenix, it's generic. It can be anything that you want it to be. But let's say this thing fails, it dies. Now, if you've ever seen the, the movie, The Princess Bride, well, there's dead and there's mostly dead, right? Mostly dead means that the supervisor can get notified and we can bring the service back in its last known good state. <clears throat> so then the service is happy so the application is happy all thanks to our angel the supervisor and Joe Armstrong we miss you Joe 
So that's OTP. And I want to talk in this talk about using OTP to design things. And in software, this is really about getting the tiny layer that wraps your application right. This is about getting the API right. But in order to get that right, everyone wants to jump ahead to the API. But to get that right, you have to design the rest of the system. And that's what we're talking about today. So it turns out that many people write, write gen servers in one big fat layer. But in, um, am I getting some messages here? Uh, I think we're going to be okay. So um, many, many people write gen servers in one big fat layer. Um, I don't believe that's the way that we should work. So James and I, the first thing that I did when, when I joined this writing team is I said that we need to talk about the layers that we think that, that, uh, that software developers using Elixir should always think about. And we came up with this acronym and initially, it was do fun things with big, loud wildebeests. And we, we both liked wildebeests because that's memorable. And you know, James was taking a trip to Africa, so he had an affinity um, to Africa. But later on, we changed that to worker bees because it turns out that the O'Reilly Company also has books with animals on the cover. And we we couldn't get the wildebeest to book because there was a, a relationship between the pragmatic bookshelf and O'Reilly. So we changed it to worker bee and we thought, hey, that works better because we're talking about layers and beehives have layers and we ha beehives have individual components um, or individual cells in the hive. And that's exactly the way that OTP works. So we think it works. So. We're going to talk about this. We're going to spend this whole talk about the sentence. Do fun things with big, loud worker bees. So do fun things with big, loud worker bees. So everybody say this with me. You could stay on mute. But do, do fun things with big, loud worker bees. Let's do that one more time. Do fun things with big, loud worker bees. Okay, but here's what those words stand for. Data, functions, and tests. And these three things make up the functional core, the core, with big boundaries, loud life cycles, workers. So that's data for do, functions for fun, things as tests, boundaries, life cycles, and workers. And the boundaries, life cycles, and workers, that's the process machinery. Or in Elixir speak, that's OTP. So if you look at your code, then we try to keep these things separately. So in the book, we use the word core or boundaries. Sometimes there are natural names for these things in your application, like a server or a service for the boundary or a core um, or you know, the library. But we like the words core and boundary because they describe what's happening. So the do fun things are the core. The big loud bees are the boundary. The big loud worker bees are the boundary. And there's one last little piece of the application. We wrote an application called Mastery, which generated little quizzes. And um, the quizzes, as you, um, as you solved more and more questions on the quiz, you would get Mastery, and it would move on to the next concept. But this is the API. So this tiny sliver of code is the piece that everyone tries to get right without trying to build the layers here. So the thing that I want to do today is to go through the sentences that do fun things with big, loud worker bees. And with each layer, I want to leave you with a single word because I know that you won't remember more. And the single word is going to capture the feeling 
of the thing underneath. So do fun things, remember, is the core. So we're talking about the core first. So do is what? It's the data, the taste of the honey, right? And the word I want you to think about is harmony. Because there are many types of programming languages, and many of us began or actually use languages day to day that are not functional languages. But the idea that a data structure is functional, it has a great bearing on the language. And it turns out that functional data structures are not necessarily even that efficient. So there's this cost of this idea in functional programming, which is immutability. Or once you build something, it stays the same. It stays built that way for the rest of its life. So for example, if I'm writing an object-oriented program and I want to change that fourth, that fourth element in a list, all I have to do is drop right in and change it directly. That's not the way functional data structures work. A typical functional program, that's not an array with contiguous slots and memory. That's a linked list that looks like this. So if I want to replace that fourth element, or if I want to replace that third element with a zero, so you see the line of code down there? Replace at the list is one, two, three, four, five. If I want to replace the second or the second index, which is the third element, so I want to replace that three with a zero, what I actually have to do is start at the head of the list and copy that first one down and copy that first two down and then rewrite that three to a zero and then I can point to the rest of the list that already exists. Because you see the in a functional language, that list one, two, three, four, five is actually six lists, right? So the one that you don't see all the way to the right of the screen is that five points to an empty list and four points to the list with five and three points to a list with four and five and so on and so forth. So there are, there are six lists there. Um, every section starting with the left expanded bigger and bigger, and those are never going to change. So when you change things at the head, your program is very efficient. And when you change things near the, the tail, your program can be very inefficient, especially if the lists are very long. So as we say, that list one, two, three is actually four lists. One, two, three, four. So if we have adopted a language where the data structures aren't inherently efficient, and that's true, well, what good is functional programming then? Well, normally we make up the difference. We make up what we lose in... Um, in this particular in this particular data organization with our algorithms or the code organization. So if we choose approaches that are in harmony with functional programming, we're going to be much better off. So that if you're building some type of a, a balance, a bank account, rather than having a balance, you should keep the list of transactions that build up the balance. And then you won't have to worry about things like an in, um, about inconsistent data because functional data structures are immutable. When somebody makes a transaction, another piece of the transaction just goes into the pot. We extend that list from the beginning. And since computing something is a lot, a lot quicker than, um, than making a long distance call to a database, um, things become much more efficient. So let's look at what happens if I change an element to that list. And if I change the, the third element of this list. So if I change the one to zero, all I have to do is change the first element and I'm done. That's extremely efficient. If I change the second one, if I have to change the second one, 
then I have to copy the head, but then I get to change the second one and the rest of the list stays the same. And if I change all the way at the tail, I basically have to rewrite the whole list. And that's incredibly inefficient. So the idea is rather than fight the immutability, embrace the immutability. So with the bank, rather than thinking in terms of, tran of a balance, think in terms of transactions. So we as object-oriented programmers always thought about the acronym CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. That's create, read, update, and delete. So we've probably all seen this before. I want to teach you a new acronym that's not as catchy. And this is the one that you could you should use with functional data structures. Cur. <laughs> so basically what I'm saying is that the two operations that are the most important are create and read. So if you can build something once and leave it alone, you are much, much better off. So we should try to build our programs that way, and we should try to build our data structures that way. So stay in harmony with the idea of functional programming as you build your data layer. It all starts with the right data. If you start with, with data that's that feels right, your API will feel right too. So the next word is fun, and that stands for the functions. And this makes up the rest of the core. And I want you to think about the functions, the functional core is the happy place. This is the core, the data and the functions. So this is where I can live in that happy elixir place called Pipeland, where one value can be, trans, uh, can be translated to another one and transformed to another one. Um, in these nice, beautiful programming constructs called pipes. Withland is the happiest place on earth. And so in the functional core, we also want to build our system so that there's a, there is 100% certainty that my data has integrity, that it's sanitized, and that it's all valid. This is all very important. And so I'd also so like to point out... Someone came off mute. There we go. So um, I'd also like to point out that you don't have to have um, the process machinery. Not everything in Elixir land needs to be needs to use OTP at all. And so if you have if you do mix new and you don't build any of the um, of the OTP machinery, that thing is a library. Otherwise, it's an application. So functional purity is not the goal. And by pure, I mean always having a function that when it takes the same arguments, it always returns the same arguments. That's certainly a helpful, a helpful characteristic of code, of a function. But we have little, in the, in the main example for the book about effective design of functional cores, we have a couple of things that aren't really pure, like this one. But there's a concept where we wanted the we wanted our game piece to um, to basically choose a question at random. This was really a concept that belonged in our core, so we had this function in our core. And the colon random, for those of you who haven't seen it before, this is actually a way in Elixir to call an Erlang module that sits underneath. And so this one, we're just calling the uniform, the random uniform function um, that, that picks um, a random number. And this, this particular function um, takes, a, takes an integer argument. So random, random two would, would return a one or a two. And so there's another impure, oh, look, there's a bug, we're gonna fix it. What's funny is that is that I've given this talk several times now, and I've never caught that bug. Ha <laughs> ha! Now it's perfect. 
So um, the date time, date time .utc now. this is another impure function, but it definitely has a home in my core. And it actually has the home in Ecto's core, where if I, when I build my timestamps, time stamps, it, um, it will create a timestamp based on um, the time now. And there are a number of ways that I can test. Now, when I decide to work against purity, then I am going to have to pay a price in the end. Um, but I normally do that in my testing layer. So we said that back here, I said that purity is not the goal. What is the goal? Having the right abstraction. So if I have an idea where I need to capture now, um, perhaps in a constructor, um, or I need to capture random, perhaps in something that makes a choice, um, or perhaps in a game, Having capturing the right abstraction is the goal, and then we we make a point to address those abstractions, those difficult abstractions in the testing layer, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the other thing that I want to talk about, the thing that makes this all work is the concept of reducers. Now, if you've seen any of my stuff on Groxio, like we have a um, we have a Tetris series, and I think the first the first seven are even free. Um, that that talks about how to build a Tetris game. But we take great pains to implement these things called reducers. And I want to basically demystify that a little bit. Let's say I have a list of one, two, and three. So, and I have a function called add, which basically adds two numbers together. And then I call reduce on that list. I'm going to get an answer back, right? So I want to drill into that a little bit. This is what we're doing. We're taking an initial accumulator, which in our case was the thing at the le left of the list. And then we're piping that to a function with the next item in the list. So you see the, the list, the list was one, two, three. So I go from one to two to three. So that's what reduce does. And I want to tell you, I cheated a little bit here. Because in enum reduce, the item and the accumulator are in a different order than something in a pipe, right? If something is piped, then the accumulator goes first. So in fact, what you want to do in Elixir whenever you can is to build reducers and put the accumulator first. And you see that all the way through, um, one of the things that, that Jose did when he created the language, based on language that had already existed for many, many years, is he made very consistent um, which arguments went in which place in the modules. For example, if he had an if he had a list called, or if he had a module called string that dealt with strings, all of the functions in there, if it had a string as an argument, that argument would be first. And that allowed us to come behind and have these beautiful pipes, which I think is a great way to think about writing a, a writing code in any language. So I, to, so, so I want you to think about, about functions in your happy place. Okay, so I'd like to stop now and take a, um, oh no, I have one more section in the core, and that's tests, right? So things is tests, and what I want you to be thinking about is predictable. So I could have put tests in the book, we could have added it to the boundary section, or we could have added it to the functional core. And we chose to add it to the functional core because when you make the decision to make your core as large and as powerful and as pure and as uh, and have as uh, data that's as that has as much integrity as possible, tests get very simple and very powerful. And I can start to do greater and greater things with my test layer. So the 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 whole idea is to test the core 
So right now there is a movement in some places in Elixir land where I don't even write test cases for the core. I start writing tests for the boundary. I don't believe that that's the way that we should be working. I believe that we should be writing tests for the core. Um, and if we look at the great minds in other places in computer science, um, you know, John Hughes, Simon Payton Jones, some of the people responsible for Haskell, um, they love the idea of having a large functional core that we can then verify. That allows me to layer complexity a little bit at a time. So if I have a massively complicated program, I can't make it any less complex if my business requirements are complicated. What I can do is pay out a little bit of the complexity layer by layer. So one of the things, one of the games that I could play is with a property-based test. So we didn't have any in the book, but this is what a property-based test looks like. So I start with this thing called a generator. It's like a constructor that's going to build a non-empty list of integers. And you could see, you could see the system building a random list that looks like this and just generates one after another. And then we pipe that to for all. So for every single item or for every single list, the following property has to be true. So the property in this case is the biggest, right? So we say the biggest item in the list is the last item of a sort. So this is my generator, this is my property, and this is my test. Let's see that again slower. This is the generator, so it generates a bunch of random data from this descriptor. And we could all probably write that code. And then for every single one of it, it's going to pipe that list through the test. So you see that faint line, the for all? So every single, for every single list that it sends us, this property must be true. And so what's happening now is the computer is writing the tests. And that's a great thing. So... This is a joke, maybe a bad one. So the props to um, this this particular link. This is a great article um, on 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 working with proper based on mix. Props also to um, one of my to one of the programmers that I respect the most in the world, John Hughes, one of the creators of Haskell. He created a tool called Quick Check based on this idea of property based testing. And also props to the guy who wrote the book for uh, property-based testing on Erlang and Elixir. His name is Fred Aber. He is um, a great mind in the Erlang world. He wrote a book called Erlang and Anger also. And so I would like to stop now and take one question. No questions? Okay, then I'll talk a little bit myself. I was going to skip through some of this, some of these ideas. Um, hi. Um, I yeah, I have a question. Sure. Okay. So, um, sorry. Uh, you, if we look um, at the data you talked about. Yes. You mentioned that we should focus on the we should focus on creating and reading, and you give the example of the bank and the balance. Yes. Um, but like. If we um, try to look at a real world scenario, you have the issue where if I'm updating a bank record, the DB is suited to lock the table or the row or the record until I'm done with the update, right? Right, so, right. As you can yeah. see, yeah, this is a great example. And so you're going yeah. to say, you're going to tell me that we need to embrace the real world and that's true, right? that um, my real world requirement is to tie to this database that has bank records, right? Yeah. But, um, but what I want, what I would want to, to, I would want to point you to a topic for study, right? Okay. And this is not so that you could replace the database with the database I'm going to tell you about, but there's a database called Datomic. So the two creators are Rich Hickey and Stuart Holloway. So D-A-T-O-M-I-C, right? And their idea is to build a database, a whole database with 
this uh, with that embraces create and read, but not update or delete, right? Yeah. So essentially, when you mark anything for when you delete anything, you just mark it for deletion. When you change the schema, you essentially change the schema in the database proper. Okay. Right. So this whole concept. So um, so I'm telling you that that because one of the things that we can do is to limit the boundary layers in our systems as much as we can. And that's the whole premise of this talk. Right. So yeah. if we decided to make our persistence or if we decided to make everything in our model persistent, then we've completely blown away all of the advantages of writing functional software, right? Yeah. So what we do instead is uh, of, um, of doing the creates and reads and updates and deletes, instead of doing that in our core layer, we move that later in our design so that we can deal with those concepts in the boundaries. Right. And one of the one of the benefits of taking that approach is that we can build a core layer, perhaps around our queries. Right. So I could have a query that composes with reducers. I see. Yeah. Right. So we're, so I'm not telling you to break your business rules and, and um, try to fight the world to install Datomic. I want yeah. to get you used to thinking about more and more of the world in um, in the terms of my um, of my core and not of my boundary. So excellent question and actually the question that I hope that I will get when I when I'm talking about this point. Right. Thanks. Okay, so let's skip ahead a little bit. So um, I think there is a question in the chat. Okay, so let's let's take that question. Can you can somebody read that for me? It says, how can we isolate impurity in our core functions if it is a requirement of our domain? Yeah, so basically the idea is that once, so impurity is something that you have to push back to the boundary layer, right? And I'm not asking you to change the business requirements. I'm trying to ask, I'm asking you to try to build as much as possible in the pure part of the, the domain, right? So for example, one of the things that you can think about is where your validation lives. So um, if, I have a, um, if I have code that I know is, um, has valid and sanitized data, then I can use pipes to reason with it, right? So um, instead of building of, of building every single function so that it can deal with impure data, what I do is I put a wrapper around my um, around my um, functional core that only allows valid sanitized data in there, right? So what I've done is I've shifted the concerns of, um, of validation out to the boundary. And I've, I've shifted the concerns of data integrity out to the boundary, right? And by doing so, every single with statement and every single check for, um, for improper data, right, can go away. And I can let it crash because then, um, because then what's happened is my, uh, my validator, um, my validator or my data sanitizer has not worked, right? So again, I'm not asking you to, um, to short your business requirements. Instead, I'm asking you to take your business requirements and decide where things like validation should live, where things like persistence should live. If you push those things away from the boundary, uh, away from the core and into the boundary, you'll be a happier programmer. Did I answer your question? Excellent. So let's move on to the boundary. And so I'd like to, to stop here for a little while because this is our happy place, right? So the boundary is a sad place. 
the word that I want you to think about is maybe because things on the boundary can fail, right? So the boundaries are not just OTP. These are, these are the places where we keep complexity and uncertainty, right? There are places where we keep unsanitized, uh, maybe insecure data. There are places where we keep processes that can fail. And so instead of pipe land, this is with land. And with land is, is a little bit of, of a more complicated look at the world. And why do I have to check every single clause? And this, in this case, the with statement only has one, um, one element. Why do I have to check them all? Well, because things can fail. So um, typically what will happen is you'll have long chains with with instead of long chains with pipes on your boundary. And this is true because, because well, we have to check everything at every instance. Um, and so um, if we want long, beautiful pipes and elixir, the only way to get there is to remove the uncertainty in the boundary and then, um, and then shift to, and shift to the, um, shift it, shift the, uh, the decisions that make things impure or uncertain out to the boundary instead of forward to the core. But I want more pipes, more reducers, and more happiness. What do you do? You write skinny handlers, right? So with OTP, this is what um, handle or this in Phoenix. This is um, this is how I implemented my Tetris game. So I had this move right. I had this new game um, thing. Um, these are different events in that. I mean, I don't, I don't really want you to focus on on the API. What I want you to focus on is the, is the idea that in in Scenic, which is an Elixir framework, in Live View, in Phoenix. If you can shift the code from that controller, from that channels handler, from the scene and out to a functional core, you're in a much better place. So the dirtiest word in a programmer's vocabulary is maybe. And we want to, we can't eliminate that from our business requirements. All that we can do is decide when we deal with the problem. And I am suggesting that we should be dealing with the problem out on the boundary instead of in the core. Okay, so loud is life cycles. And you might be surprised that we don't have something that stands for S and supervisors. But the whole thing that I want you to think about is a paradigm. So if you start thinking about OTP as something that manages life cycle, the whole discussion gets a lot easier. So that if you look at the vocabulary around OTP, it has words like start. It has um, look, look up so that I can start something. It has start link. It has strategy, a startup strategy that's configuration. These are all about achieving a clean startup. Um, and maybe that's in case things fail in the supervision um, case, but maybe it's when things start initially. But when you get the clean, a clean startup and a clean shutdown and you get supervision, you get all the OTP goodness for free. You get that scalability and the performance. And that was the genius of Joe Armstrong. So I don't really want to talk about the life cycles very much. I basically want to tell you that, um, that you should think about things in terms of life cycles. And I bet that when you dig into... Um, your OTP code next time, a light bulb will go off if it hasn't already and, say, and, and you'll say, oh, this is all dealing with starting up and shutting down, not just me, but my children cleanly. Okay, so the last piece is worker bees used to be wilder beasts, and I'm, I'm a little bit sad, but worker bees will work just fine. Um, these are workers. This is process ceremony that doesn't necessarily um, live in the model itself. And here, what I want you to think about is the idea of balance. So when I have, when I have ceremony, for example, the ceremony of when I work with my database, think about moving that code from the boundary to the core. 
that's really the whole premise of this talk. So if you have some, if you have a database dependency, that should be implemented in the boundary. And you should do as much work as possible to get that out to the boundary. So what we did in designing Elixir um, systems with OTP is we delayed our persistence as far as, as long as we could. And I don't really mean in terms of um, it, performance when that happened, but I mean in terms of the design of the application when that could happen. We built a whole different persistence service so that when it was time to answer the question, I could pass in a persistence function that did nothing, right? That would just let us persist the state in OTP. Or I could call it and this persistence function could actually put the records in the database. And this is actually using that function in OTP. You see the function um, is whatever is passed in plus um, this, this function that essentially just passes things straight on through that doesn't do anything, um, anything additional, right? And so then um, when I add persistence as a service in this way, then, um, then I can have a much bigger, much more robust core. And I could actually have a cleaner abstraction on my database layer as well. This is the way that you'll see a lot of Haskell code written. So the thing that I want you to think about in this area is balance. So we've talked about do fun things with big loud worker bees and now you know what it means. Now you know that if you have a complex system, you can take that complex system and you can't remove all the complexity. What you can do is deal with the complexity a layer at a time. And my contention is that if you deal with as much complexity as possible in the core rather than the boundary, you will be a happier developer and you will live longer in whatever language you work in. Thanks, James. We love you, James. We love you, Joe. And I'm taking questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi. Okay, this is your turn. So what is an impure function? That's a good question. Um, an impure function, so in functional programming, we have functions, uh, functions that are expressed like my add function. So if you pass a two and a seven into my add function, you're always gonna get nine. If you do it 10, if you, if you run that function through, 10 times you're gonna get nine. If you run it through a million times, you're gonna get nine. So the same inputs will give you the same outputs. So an impure function is something like, for example, date time dot now, right? So now is, what day is it? The 14th? Um, and so, and, and you know, right, right here in Chattanooga, it's 7.20. Um, you know, there it's a little bit later. You're, you're probably a little happier. You probably had your coffee. Um, so, um, but the impure functions, um, you can have them, but dealing with them requires things like the property based test, right? So, um, so I'm going to have to, to use a more sophisticated, um, testing technique, right? So one of the things that we did is when we built a random number, um, we would pass it um, something like, um, we would say, give me a random uniform from 1 to 20. And then we would run a test that said, hey, build a stream. And this thing will eventually be um, 1, and it will eventually be 20. Other questions? Let's see. Is bring up the chat. Yeah? yeah. Hello. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm not hearing you very well. Can you restart? Yeah, I didn't get that. So, Moha, if you could type into, if you could type your question 
into the, the chat. I can see it. Ah, oh, it's Mohammed. I love that name. I have a mentee named Mo. Okay, more questions on the chat. Okay, so while they're typing in, uh -huh. I'm just trying to get the difference between, um, so what if I already have a Phoenix application? Yep. And um, my Phoenix application kind of have a particular structure. Yeah. So uh, it involves going to the database. It involves listening to API calls. Okay. It involves doing API fetches. So uh, which part of my Phoenix application can I make um, can I move over to the boundary and what can I have at the core, for example? Yes, yes. So um, in Phoenix, there's a very strong, um, there's a very strong design preference. Um, so Jose and Chris moved these concepts into contexts, right? So if you look at, um, at generated code within, within um, Phoenix, you'll see that you don't ever see um, queries executed in the um, in the schemas themselves, right? And there's a reason for that because that's supposed to be core code and not boundary code, right? So think about the context wrapper. Um, that thing is the boundary, right? Um, think about controller code. That's the boundary. And you you'll notice that even chain sets, a chain set is that boundary or core. Well, it's the chain set itself is a core concern, right? When you implement the chain set based on user input, that becomes boundary code because we can't trust the data anymore, right? So the idea is that you'll see chain sets written and manipulated in the, um, in the schemas themselves, but you'll actually see them called and used and consumed in the boundary. Which is the um, which is the context code wherever it's possible, right? And so context, all it is is a, it's a wrapper. It's the API for the code that sits underneath. Okay, so there's a great question here that I want to take. Um, in testing boundaries and general testing, what is your recommended approach to unit testing? Okay, so um, uh, Schweeb. Is it Schweib? Did I get that right? Or Schweib? Let's call it Schweib. So Schweib, that's an excellent question. And there's a one of the best talks that I've ever seen at a conference um, on this topic was at Lone Star Elixir this year. And I don't know if it's been released yet, but we, um, if you follow our YouTube mm -hmm. channel, that's, yeah. um, that's YouTube dot com slash c slash groxio g-r-o-x-i-o um then you're looking for a, a talk and i'll type i'll type the title here friend or foe so it's called testing friend or foe chain or cable and the idea is that the test that we write can be like the great cables that you see spanning large distances, or they can be like small chain links. And the, um, the presenter's contention is that we need both, but we should lean more heavily towards the chain, the chain tests. Chain tests are basically in harmony with functional programming. And when you have a fat core and a skinny boundary, then you can have few cable tests, which are integration tests, which are boundary tests, and more, um, more robust and more powerful core tests, things like property-based tests. That's one of the, one of the best um, questions of the day. Great question. More questions. You said you wanted to talk to Bruce Tate. You got him right here. Ask a question. Thank you, Getty. So the comment was great session and you're quite welcome. So can everybody give me a thumbs up or thumbs down on the um, in the message line? Uh, there's no thumbs down, Bruce. Okay. 
<laughs> I didn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I know that this talk is a little bit of heresy, right? Um, so there are things in the Elixir community um, where people like their their um, boundary code. Um, so there are a couple of a couple of operations. But what I want to invite you to do is not do everything that I say. What I want you to invite you to do is think about things critically. Think about whether you like, whether you really like Pipeland or Withland, and if it's worth shaping your code in a certain way to get there. Thumbs up. Wonderful. Wonderful. No thumbs down. I'm almost a little bit disappointed. But um, hey, so we have to do this again. Um, I have another talk that I would love to give you um, sometime. I think there's a question. There's a question for us. What are your thoughts on typed Beam languages like Gleam? Um, okay, so that's typed Erlang. Um, so I know that there was an effort to do typed Elixir um, some time back. There might still be a, an effort to do something like a typed Elixir. Um, so I'm assuming that the Gleam is the Facebook language. Um, that's the typed Erlang. Um, so I think it's not a bad thing. But if you if you ask if if you ask me, oh, so uh, Harrison, there's a book called Adopting Elixir. Um, Jose said it better than any of us us could. I wrote that book with him, but more to provide voice for that. And also Ben Marks was the heart and soul of that writing team. Um, he actually introduced Elixir to Bleacher Report. Um, which is probably the most successful implementation in the world. So, um, and so, um, but the the typed Beam languages, um, I believe that the goodness in Elixir trumps the the good in um, in um, in typing. Um, but I, I also believe that there's a little bit of a um, we're fighting our tools a little bit when we try to make um, Elixir something that's fully strongly typed. So there's a there's a really interesting take on this on this concept called Norm, N O R M, and that's a guy named Chris Keithley. And you guys should invite Chris to speak with your users group if you can get him to wake up, or you might have to wake up. Um, but uh, there's so there's a norm framework, and the idea of the norm framework is to go beyond types and test input data in terms of its whole preconditions. And you can do that only on the tests, um, only on the boundary layers. Um, I don't think that it's performant enough to do all the way through a system. But um, it's so there there are a whole lot of languages that have had great success with having this kind of um, input check a sanity check for the state of the arguments when they're inbound. Yeah, Chris Keith. Ah, oh, there it is. Thank you. Somebody uh, posted in the chat, Chris Keithley's. Um, are, uh, am I available to guide in writing a technical Elixir book? I am a, I'm an Elixir editor. Um, is it Siku? Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my, um, Actually, my job in some ways. Um, love to talk with you. There so it's seven thirty. Uh, okay, there was another question. Yeah, from Joe. I think uh, he left it. He was saying, "Is there an example of an application or use case demonstrating this? Uh, these ideas, the do fun things." So. Yeah, I think. Okay, that's yeah. What he meant. Yeah. So um, we use the concepts pretty heavily at I can make it better. Um, there are also people, um, so essentially these ideas are ideas from other programming language ecosystems. Um, I don't remember the name of the programming paper, but there's a powerful programming paper um, that, uh, that I can't remember. I'll, I'll try to send, I'll, I'll try to at you on Twitter and, um, and point it out. Um, but the... But it's so these ideas are Haskell ideas where instead of um, the functional core and the um, the boundary, they called them the imperative shell. 
and the functional core and the imperative shell. The imperative shell was essentially the boundary, but they added a layer in between because um, Haskell is a typing language with better support for abstract types. I guess you could you could say we could add a proto a um, a protocol between the boundary and core, and that would um, be a very commonly applied pattern in the Haskell programming language. Okay, so um, I hope that we get to do this again sometime. I hope that the next topic that we can talk about is a talk called Joy. Um, it's one that I gave in India, but it's one that I've extended since. Um, and I wanna talk about the concepts of, um, of how to manage a programming career um, in a pretty demanding world. Um, how do you advocate for yourself? How do you, um, how do you set your priorities um, so that you find yourselves in, in good situations and that you set, set for yourself positive goals for growing as a programming professional? Um, if that's not enough of a technical talk, I'll understand, but I would love to give that talk for um, this group sometime. And that's all I have. Are there more? Uh, are there any Elixir implementations in the financial OTP domain? Um, there are a bunch. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't know exactly what they are. Uh, probably the person that you should ask is Francesco Cesarini, who's also active on Twitter. Um, let's see. Would I mind doing a session on Broadway outside of the standard use cases? That's not me. Uh, you're going to have to talk Jose into that one or somebody from the Platform Tech team. Okay, that's it for me. Um, hey, listen, everyone, I have enjoyed meeting with you tremendously. I think that when we do this, the world gets a little smaller. And I would love to stay and hang out on a chat, but I also want to invite people that want to leave to leave. So, um, oh, Platform, yeah, Platform, yeah. So uh, what is it? Uh, what is uh, Jose's company? I can't remember now. Um, the new one, Dashbit, right, right, right. So he asked me about the brand. I love the brand. Um, yes, old habits die hard, right? So um, I'm going to um, disappear for about one minute to get some coffee, um, and then I'll be right back down. Um, so anybody who would like to drop off can drop off, and otherwise, um, hopefully we can – um, we can talk talk with each other for a little bit. I'll be right back. All right, Chantel. Chantel is still there. Hello. Yeah, you can just finish it off. Okay, so um, I, on behalf of Eliza Kenya. And the entire Elixir Kenya community, let me call it Fraternity of Elixir Software Engineers here together. And on my own behalf, extend a very heart, very hearty vote of thanks to Bruce for gracing his important work and sharing with us his findings and opinions today. So a big thank you to Bruce for his efforts towards building programs in LAS. I particularly like to what he talked about do fun things with big loud worker bees and narrowed it down to data functions, taste, boundaries, life cycles, and workers, and most especially supervisors, which in this case was life cycle servers. The way in which he explained this subject was extraordinary. I would like to thank the organizing team and the community at large for the momental, monumental support. Finally, I would like to thank you all for attending this event and making it a success. Uh, so it's a free world. Feel free to live at your own time. Where's our prize? Oh, yeah. Um, there's a giveaway prize Bruce is giving. So it's he's actually giving you a 25% discount for this book he's talking about. If you're interested, you can DM me. I'll give you all the details. Actually, um, we'll we'll uh, donate a book. Uh, Groxia will donate a book for um, if you want to do a drawing. If you want to do a drawing, which kind of drawing? Uh, so basically, um, at the at the next event, or if you have a role of people who are here for this event, um, 
then just pick a name, let us know, and um, and we'll make sure to get you an ebook. Uh -huh. the, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so, uh, Bruce? Yes. Yeah, so I, I know I was trying to check out your book on um, the Amazon stores, and I realized the hard copy is for $44. Now, um, I think that I, I, I'm, more, I'm not a writer, but I, I like to say that writers outside of Africa need to consider price parity. Uh, and I know that I, I also speak for the Indian region. You know, uh, because of the fact that the uh, currency exchange rates are quite high. So $44 for someone from Nigeria uh, shipping an Amazon book to Nigeria, it's more than $44 because the cost of shipping is quite high. So it's not, not like where, what you have with European countries or US-based countries where Amazon kind of delivers sometimes free, you know. So I, I like to say that perhaps 25% um, is uh, would look at face value looks like a big uh, big relief but again for developers from Africa due to currency exchange especially now occasioned by the problems economic crisis we're facing or looking ahead into running into uh, it's, it's quite key if uh, we could have such um, um, big magnanimity from writers and authors of books that we are interested in having yeah, so you're going to see a different kind of response from me than um, than through the Pragmatic Bookshelf. So, um, Pragmatic Bookshelf is is um, one of the last great technical publishing companies, um, and um, so what's happening is um, Amazon is hurting the authors too. So, um, so there are a couple of things. First, the supply chain. Um, is very difficult in the publishing world where by the time that you have a book that's that's completed and published, um, it's almost not relevant anymore, right? So, um, and then the, the second thing is that Amazon is, um, if there is a, um, a book topic that's relevant and is published in, so there's more um, paper than eBooks, which is almost never true anymore. But, um, but when that, when that is true, um, you know, what, what happens is um, we tend to find that, that the books that are successful get resold on Amazon a lot and they benefit. So Amazon benefits and the authors don't. Um, and um, when we have books that, um, that are for delivery in places that are not part of the, um, the main supply chain, they take so long to get there that the returns are in such great numbers that it's really just not price competitive, right? So what you're seeing on Amazon is one world price. You know, I can't help you there, right? And I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I do understand, and I do understand that it is an opportunity and access thing. So one of the things that you're seeing in response from me, um, a very small company, I have products at every price point. Um, right. And so I have a 22 video series that took me about um, a month and a half to two months to create on building Tetris with Phoenix Live View that talks about these layering concepts. And that's um, $10 US, which is still quite expensive, but it is much more in line with something um, that, that can be priced on the world market. Um, so you'll see on products like that for me from time to time. And when you see a price point like that, recognize that Americans won't buy it. Um, and, but I believe that it's important to serve the world market. So I do those things for you. All right, thank you very much. That's, that's a good one. Um, you're quite welcome. And I, I'm sorry again about, um, about the state of publishing. It's really not on the technical publishers. It is the economics um, with, you know, the, the aggregators, everything has changed. Um, and I'm thinking about these problems and I'm concerned about these problems because I believe that if we want a world where everyone has a voice, then um, we have to make the, um, we need to build some programmers in this chat room right here. Right. Um, and we, we can't do that without um, without addressing some of the inequities in the cycle. True, very true. 
more questions. Well, I have uh, a I have a soft skill question uh, sure. for you as a writer, especially. So, how do you find the the concentration to calmly sit down and uh, focus on the idea and bring that to paper? Because for me, it uh, I don't know. It, my my mind is just driving away and. It, can take me an hour to write an email so i have the feeling i can't produce more code than written human text so how do you do it yeah so so basically um i get asked that question a lot i think that there's two things um the first is the main skill with writing a book is advocating for yourself professionally right so when when i was a consultant writing books was easy because it was my, my marketing right um, if I didn't do that, I didn't eat. Um, when I was working with other companies, I would say, hey, um, it is worth um, having a better programmer in Bruce Tate um, after I have done an effort like this, right? So that's the most important skill. Um, and so the second thing is that you need large enough blocks of time um, where your mind can work, right? So flow is really a thing. As developers, we need to be able to turn off interruptions um, during during certain times, right? Um, and so there are people believe that believe that I am just not accessible and I'm not kind um, and not responsive because I believe that flow is a thing. Um, and um, I spend time, um, a good amount of time every week writing. Right. And, and, and carving out those blocks of times is important for me. So I basically just turn off all notifications for a while. And when I'm focusing on writing, I'm focusing on writing. Um, I don't have, you know, Slack's off, you know, Skype is off, Zoom is off. I'm not taking any calls. Um, and so that's that's an important skill is turning off on the all the distractions. And then the um, the third skill is being able to deal with imperfection. Right. And so um, my first draft at anything stinks, and my editor will tell you that. And so um, I need to be able to write things down which are less than perfect because it's easier to build a second good version than a um, than a first the, uh, than a first. Um, it's easy to improve a second version to be a good good thing than it is to write a good uh, a good first version the first time. So are you was, trying to to produce volume uh, as a draft first up and then chisel the the details out? No, I'm trying to rough out the ideas. All right, right. And so um, and so for me, um, so right now I'm writing OTP again. So I'm writing, the, so I have a program called Programmer Passport, which again is price for the world market. The, um, the subscription is 15 bucks um, and it's the price is there. Um, even though it's like, it's Bruce Tate's Ideas Club because I believe, I believe that it's a premium product, but I believe that it's a product that should work on the world market. But um, I have to write um, really about um 80 pages every two months or um or 40 pages every month um in addition to all the other work and, and then then to do some videos on top of that as well yeah. um but but i'm doing it full time right so now um, my flow is pretty good because you know before um as i was building roxio i was working on the printing press and writing the books at the same time and that, that was that did not go well Hello, Bruce. Yes. So what is your advice on Elix uh, true Elixir beginners? True Elixir beginners. So the first thing is um, believe in yourself, right? So um, I, I have often, I often hear um, rich kids ask me, so you're a traveler. How are you a traveler? And I, I tell them it's not it doesn't have anything to do with money that um, that being a traveler. The first thing you have to do is see yourself as a as a traveler. Right. So the first thing that you have to do is believe in yourself and see yourself as a programmer. So the second thing that you have to do is learn to learn. And so find resources um, where um, where learning is you know fun and um, and where you can embrace it. 
So I am trying to think of, so at eight o'clock my time, or I'm sorry, 1600 my time, what time is it there? 4 p.m. Okay, uh, no, eight, I'm sorry, uh, 1800. So, um, so at 6 p.m., at 6 p.m., what time is it on your... 6 p.m. for me is what time for you? If you give it in GMT, it will be easier. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. So <laughs> I can, but I can Google, say, what time is it yeah. in Kenya? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to say, okay. So you are, um, let's see, two hours plus five hours. So you are seven hours. Uh, that won't work. So I was about to say we have some mentoring sessions um that um that are usually for local people in chattanooga but obviously we're doing them online now um so um if you wanted to join those you can um so um i'm gonna throw out um a so maggie at so she is the keeper of the list and the group is elixir so that'd be a hard thing to do to wake up for um, wake up early early in the morning to get some mentoring, but you could do that. Um, so yeah, so my first piece of advice is believe in yourself. Second piece of advice is find a mentor that you trust. The best way to become a good coder is to code with people that you really um, that you really trust. All right, Bruce. I'm not sure if you've answered this question. I'm going to try reading it out for you. Okay. You're your videos are well produced. The live view was really good. What tools do you use for recording and editing? That was from Shuaib. Uh, one second. I, I'll, uh, let me get the video person here. One second. <laughs> hey, Maggie. There's a question for you. Yeah, it's yeah. Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the video editor is coming, it's coming down. <laughs> <laughs> hi. Yeah, hi, yeah. Nagi. How are hey, you? Bro. Yeah. So, so <laughs> this is a question from a friend of mine. Uh, your videos are well produced. The live view was really good. What tools do you use for recording and editing? Sure. So Bruce does all the recording on the screencast uh, on his computer, which is a MacBook. And then um, we use the um, Final Cut Pro to do the editing. And then I use Soundstripe uh, for the music. It's a subscription. OK, cool stuff. Cool yeah. Stuff. Any other right. questions? Uh, not really. OK, no. cool. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Bye. Hey. Awesome. <laughs> There you go. You got a double. You got some video production in. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah the, uh, the I use QuickTime for just the QuickTime screencast for for most of it. But the main thing is that you have to be able to see in um, you know you need to be able to see on a timeline what's happening so you can make the cuts. And I mean, I know that I I, I do a lot more stumbling that shows up on those videos, and it's almost seamless the way she takes out the eh, uh uh. You know, I, I, when you're live coding, it's, it's almost <laughs> incoherent, you know, it's, it's pretty funny. Okay, so let me give you another one that um, I've, I've been speaking with a few people. Um, you know, when you start out this career and spend some time, you become a polyglot more. Like, I noticed you wrote your a book on Java in 2004, you wrote other, some other books, and then now you're, you're doing the OTP thing, and I'm sure you've mentioned Prolog, you've mentioned the Erlang and Haskell, I think. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I get the feeling that it becomes a, a drag, a problem, trying to know exactly what you are at certain points. Because um, uh, just now you are an Elixir guy. And for some of us who have got day jobs, uh, you are a Java guy somewhere, you are a, a, a PHP guy somewhere, you are a Pythonist somewhere, and then you are an Elixir guy somewhere. Uh, how do you how do you handle the, that mind shift? That uh, do you do you get that feeling that look look it looks like I'm crazy, like I'm an imposter somewhere? <laughs> so uh, you know, it's it's scary 
I believe that this is that learning languages is the most important thing that a programmer can do. And um, so I have a program right now. So Groxio is about learning languages. And it might it might not stay that way. Like it might it might become strictly an Elixir program, but we're trying to make a go of actually saying, hey, boss, give me some time to learn something that is completely unrelated to my daily job. Right. And okay. um, I believe that when you do that, so there's there's a you guys know Dave Thomas, right? Yeah, I know Dave Thomas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he yeah, is yeah. he is my mentor, and he's yeah. um, you know I, I will call like an angry mentor, right? Not really. <laughs> he's always he's always kind and polite, yeah. but he will tell you <laughs> he will tell you what you need to do, right? So uh, he's not a he's not a person that I would call and spend time with every day. He's a person that was always there, providing advice and providing sound counsel at every. Um, every time that I grew a lot in my career, um, whether it was as a public speaker, coming on as an author, learning languages, getting established in Ruby, getting established on Elixir, all these things, Dave Thomas was there. Well, he gave this talk called the, um, the Dreyfus model. So Maggie's going to be releasing a video today that's basically the marketing pitch for the idea of Groxio, right? And what it says is that there's this, there's this learning model um, by the Dreyfus brothers who were in the United States Air Force, and they were trying to find out how to teach um, American pilots how to do, how to practice their craft. And they found that a beginner learns in a very different way than an expert, and that it was very important to, um, to teach in a certain way and to learn in a certain way if they wanted to, to be able to fly. Now, if you think about that model where there's a one that's a beginner and there's a five that's an expert and that there are these different kinds of steps that you have to go to between being, being a novice and being an expert, as a programmer, that thing is the most important skill that you have. Right, because the half life of our, our knowledge is like everything goes away every year, year and a half. Right. So um, the ability to kind of crank through that quickly and absorb new technologies and apply those new technologies and get an extra tool in your toolbox every time you do it is an amazingly powerful thing. So um, so that's so you see two things out of me right now. One, um, we're doing this Groxio thing where the monthly subscription is more like, so we believe it is a thing that can transform careers. And we are pricing this at $15 rather than $100 a month, right? And the reason is that we believe that um, if you can advocate for yourself and say, boss, this is going to make you a better uh, programmer. This is not a this is not a sunk cost. This is an investment. Do this for your best developers. It will pay off. Um, I don't I don't believe that there is anybody um, who who gets on a program like that and does it faithfully um, that that will be left behind. I think that it will tremendously. Um, help accelerate a career. So um, yes, I, so let me challenge your assertion. I believe that since you are um, since you are not as much of a language learner, that you have you have something to learn. It's funny to hear all these people in in the room. Probably many of you believe that uh, that um, I am a better programmer than you. I doubt that that is true all the way across this room. I bet that there are better programmers in this room than I am. I'm a very good teacher. I'm not a very good programmer. Well, how to become a good teacher when you're a good programmer? That's the key. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> so I think that my superpower, um, <laughs> I think Sigur is probably better than me also. <laughs> 
so uh, so um, yeah, that's a how do you become a good good teacher? So I believe that my my superpower is dyslexia. You guys know that word? It's people who don't oh, read very effectively. Yes. Well, I'm very much dyslexic. So let me tell you a long and winding story, as I always do, to these short questions. Um, so the friend James Gray that wrote the book with me, um, he is interesting because he is very nearly a quadriplegic. He doesn't have use of his legs at all. He barely has use of his hands. And he is also the best programmer and the fastest programmer that I know. So think about that. And the reason is that he has to automate everything. And he has to get everything right the first time. Right? So the reason... What is his name again? James Gray. Um, James Gray the second. He always spells it James E. Gray II. And he's the co-author on Designing Elixir Systems and OTP, the, the book that we just talked about. And so I believe my superpower is dyslexia. Since I don't process big walls of text very well, I have to be able to break things down into simple concepts. And so my main superpower is the ability to deal with complexity. And that's what I can do with my programming. Um, I take things into layers. I have very small functions, and everything is super easy to understand. Everything is super well named. And I will stop my programming for 10 or 15 minutes to find the right name for something. That's a good one. We all know this pain. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so to me, to me, that's a, you know, if you want to be able to teach, you need to be able to break complex ideas down into simple things. And that once you can do that, you'll find that it translates to coding very well. It's quite amazing. You have dyslexia and you're just such a good author. <laughs> right. My editor thinks so, too. She laughs pretty hard when she sees some of the words that I misspell. Or, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But um, I learned long ago that um, I can use, I can um, write with fear and try not to misspell words. And that reduces the number of words that I type. Or I can write with confidence and let the people who are good spellers be good at spellers, right? Yeah. So dyslexia is, it, it teaches me. So it, what dyslexia is, is basically, it's a phonetic disability. And that means that I don't have the um, brain centers um, in good repair that actually translate the, um, the individual phonetics of the English language, right? Like, um, I'm looking at the word code right now, C-O-D-E, um, that's code, right? Um, I don't break it down that way. I see code as one big fat symbol. Right. Um, yeah. And so if I, I can make myself break it down that way and do that, um, but it doesn't feel like riding a bike like most of you, it feels um, very difficult. But what I can do instead is recognize bigger, more complex symbols. And that recognition has allowed me, I believe, to see things that um, that evolve in the industry before other people can sometimes. Like I was very early on Elixir. I was very early um, on enterprise uh, or off of enterprise Java beans when that came out, I could see that that wasn't going to be the right thing um, that, um, you know, I could see Ruby um, take off and um, that it was good for me because it allowed me to manage complexity. Um, I could see all these kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, gift in disguise, very much, so, very much so. And I think that we're all kind of shaped that way, um, you know, being being from Kenya is a gift. And um, as I've worked with other mentees, um, I have seen um, powerful perspectives that just aren't represented in a white male programming world. And um, I just, I so strongly um, believe that we need to get better at, um, at, at making, making the programming, the Elixir programming, 
programming community look more like the world. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, there's another question, Bruce. Yeah. Yeah, by Chantel. Uh, she's asking um, the number of years that you program, does that count to how good you are in programming? That's. Uh, yes. uh, <laughs> um, okay, so let me let me be a heretic a little bit longer, right? Um, you've been so kind and gentle toward my um, heretical ideas, right? Ideas that are different from the rest of the Elixir community. So most of us believe that we are learning all the time. I don't believe that we are learning all the time. I believe that our job, if we want to be great programmers, is to maximize the time that we're learning, right? Maximize, minimize the time that we're doing this. Most of us get good at a task and then spent years doing the same task in the same way and getting marginally better, right? The way to really accelerate your learning is to make yourself a novice again in something over and over and over. And as you do that, you start to build additional powerful skills and you start to build the ability to learn. And the best programmers aren't the ones who can apply OTP in the same way over and over and over. They're the ones that can find what's next. Like I'll have one of the first live view courses. You know, we um, we teach live view in very small groups, um, and we'll we'll have one of the the first few live view courses um, out there. Um, so, and and the reason is that I know how to learn things. Um, I'm good at that, and I know how to extract. Um, the core concepts and present them in, in a way that people can understand them. I'm good at that. So did I answer your question? I think I did. So the years, the years that you code, no. The years that you do or the, the, the small periods of time that you do very formative things, right? Learning new things, new ideas, new languages. And so if you have a boss and your boss is willing to listen and your boss trusts you, um, well, if your boss doesn't trust you, then you've got to either fix that or find a new boss, right? Um, so, but if your boss trusts you, then then you can slowly carve out time for yourself to explore these things, right? It's it's really important to really have a um, a fresh mind, and and it doesn't work for the boss to say, hey, um, take your 45, 50, 60 hour week and make it a 65 hour week. That's on you, that doesn't work, right? Because that puts you in a different mindset. You have to have the um, the clear, clean beginner's mind. And you can't do that under pressure. You have to basically freeze some time that you already have somehow, somehow, and um, and actually do the, the hard work of learning. And um, if you can do that um, with your boss's blessing, um, that's, by far the best way. So the most important skill a programmer can have is a soft skill, the ability to learn. And that skill means that you have to have the skill of diplomacy, of teaching the value to your boss. Well, I think there's a caveat to this because the plateau you described is also known as the OK plateau. And I think it's it's important to have the right time within this plateau. Uh, not too long to get too comfortable with the the boring work and and just degrade in your learning curve uh, but long enough to know what works good for you and what works ba uh, bad so that you can transfer this knowledge onto other uh fields where you are a novice again yeah so you're tapping into the dreyfus learning model again right so that says so we're it's, it's, we're saying that um that it's really important to be able to get from beginner to okay, right? And there's another piece of the Dreyfus learning model that the best way to um, to take a, a um, like a, a an adequate, a competent programmer, the best way to make them a good to great programmer is to have them teach. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's all Dreyfus, right? And it's all kind of the 
the thing that I try to do with um, with Programmer Passport. That's a fine man method, no? Yeah. You're right. Being a good teacher is really hard. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a reason that that's true. I bet. So Ashraf, I think I got that name right. So Ashraf, I believe that um, that um, being a, a teacher of somebody that's far beneath you in skill is very hard. I bet that you'll find if you're trying to teach somebody who is slightly beneath you, you'll find that much easier. And um, so what you have to do is find places where you have common ground and teach to those and let um, and basically as you can grow those pieces of common ground, you'll grow the, the pieces where you can effectively teach. Okay, so we're at 807. I bet I've got 15 more minutes if you guys want to hang out 15 more minutes. Any more questions? Well, I'm curious about your take on uh, what's coming next in the Elixir world and how Elixir could um, succeed against all the other technologies and especially the big corporations when you see um, people uh, or corporations like Google and Facebook pushing out their languages into the market. How can Elixir compete with all that? Okay, so if you're watching, one of the things that's happening right now is Chris McCord is just released Release Candidate 2 for Phoenix 1.5, right? And the reason that that's important is it has um, it has Live View in it. Has anybody played with Live View yet? Yeah, and Nerves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So with Live, live but, View, the thing about that is that, thing about that if you're building a web application... Um, the, the days of the request response application are gone, right? So what's happened over and over in the industry, so I gave a talk called The Pendulum that talks about this. And, and there's an idea that we have gone back and forth between something that's a batch-oriented program, like request response, like a green screen, to something that's much more rich, like client-server. And then we went back to a batch, like a very, very much a form-based web application. And then we went back to something that was that was pretty rich, like like Google Mail and Google Maps. And we're still in the pendulum swing back to the rich clients. And the reason that people can't do it today are twofold. First is that there is a um, there's an idea that the way to make the web scale is taking all state out of it, right? So that every request becomes the same. And it's much easier for um, to scale the process and memory and things like that. Well, it turns out that it is very hard that, that what that's done is it makes very scalable systems where the programmer has to do all of the work and all of the imagination. Right. And doing all of that imagination is super <laughs> demanding. And it also pushes us in the uh, into the um, into the space where we are building distributed applications that have to work across languages. Every single application that we build is a distributed app that works across languages, across JavaScript and whatever your middle. Is. And that's insane. That is really insane. So what Elixir does is three things. First, it has this concept of OTP and reducers, right? And OTP and reduce. So, so the idea of reducer is that you have, you break down everything such that everything has one tiny responsibility to take a thing and produce another thing of the same type with some small change, whether you're just incrementing a counter or whether you're building the state for a live view. Right. So that's OTP. The second thing is that Elixir has infrastructure. Right. So if you if you were to compare something with uh, similar productivity and that's Ruby on Rails, if you were to prepare the uh, compare uh, Ruby on Rails or Python, just a single instruction, a single request. Get something within like 
five or six X um, performance difference, right? So maybe you could do it in, um, I don't know, like one unit in, in Elixir, five or six units for Rails if you're doing a lot of caching or something like that. But that's average response time. So what applications like Live you do is that whenever you make any kind of change, whenever you're filling out a form to do the validation, it's sending a round trip request to the server automatically. And that means that every single user will get hundreds or even thousands of tiny requests. And so the average response time is not important. What's important is not as important. What's important is the response time of the slowest transaction, right? And so if you are no more than one standard deviation, remember those, those high school statistics, right? So if you're no more than one standard deviation away from the norm, then everybody gets a smooth performance and the application works. If you drift two standard deviations out and your performance is degrading significantly, you're in trouble. And the problem is that when a single user has a thousand interactions, that user is going to experience some dropped, some dropped request responses. And that just doesn't work, right? So that's why Live View is such a big deal. It's so powerful, right? So I think that, you know, one of the questions, ah, I wish I would have thought of this earlier. Um, so um, who was the who was the woman that that asked about um, about uh, advice for beginner beginning programmer? Are you still on? Yes, I'm here. Um, which uh, and your name again? Remind me your name. Chesunim. Chesunim. Did I get that right? Chesunim. Chesunim. Yes. So, um, so one of the things that I have noticed is that one of the reasons that I'm mentoring um, folks so heavily right now is that most of the world is still working in object-oriented systems, right? And object-oriented systems can't do the work that Phoenix can do because the whole programming model is just wrong. It doesn't fit very well. So, um, so as you are learning functional programming, what you're effectively doing is skipping a generation of the object-oriented stuff that everybody else on the planet is going to have to unlearn. And when you establish yourself, if you, if you learn hard and work hard, as you establish yourself, you're going to be one of the few people in the world that know how to build this new generation of, of application that, that doesn't have all this JavaScript and all this Elixir or Ruby or Python or Go. It is just Elixir. And it's much more efficient for teams to work in. It makes a much better user experience. So I believe Phoenix Live View is the next thing. So there was a, um, so can somebody Google real quick for Chris McCord's Twitter demo and drop the video um, into the, the chat? So I would like, I would like you, um, I would like, is it, was it Tracy? So Tracy, I would like you to take a look at that movie and learn enough to be able to do that and learn enough to be able to demonstrate um, those concepts um, and actually use those. And I think that what you'll find is that you are more valuable um, in the coming years than, um, than the peers who are still writing um, object-oriented code. You might have to work a little bit harder to find your work, and that's okay. But the work that you will find um, will be available on the world market, which is, I think, a very powerful thing for you. Yeah, um, Bruce, I'd like to add something onto that. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the other challenge that we can face, that we usually face is if you're training a bunch of people how to program, um, you're torn between teaching them OOP or functional programming. Now, if you must, um, if you want to get them a job, uh, let's say in Kenya right now, if you want to get them a job, then you have to train them OOP. 
which Ruby on Rails comes in. But if you are to teach them um, the functional that sometimes you do, uh, if you take them to Elixir, they might never get the job in time, and they really need that job. Yeah, yeah. So that's a so that's a what big you said turnaround, really applies right? to management, but uh, to an absolute beginner, it's usually a tough. Uh, it's usually a tough thing to do because I know very little uh, companies in Kenya that use Elixir or any yes. other function. Yes. yes. So, so basically, we teach. So, we are working with um, with beginning programming mentees um, on a weekly basis. So, the reason that my conferences exist is to build relationships between people in the United States that are underrepresented, and um, and the best programmers in the world, and the people that have the jobs. Right. So, um, what we have found is that not everybody that we have mentored is actually getting a job in Elixir. But we found that they are better problem solvers than, um, than the people who are using a lower level abstraction. So someone who has learned the concepts in Elixir has learned to think critically, has learned to think in terms of transformations, They've learned to program and layer better than people who don't work with Elixir. Um, so that's my bet. So, for example, we had a man that is uh, that was walking the floor on Amazon. That means that he um, he was um, basically moving boxes all day, and he was walking. Um, oh, I think it was 18 miles every day, um, 11 to 12 hours, um, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, and he was one of our mentees. Um, he is now working at Google. He's not coding Elixir, but he's working at Google. Um, we have another woman who, um, and, and basically he's not writing code at all. He's working as a um, as a um, as a data as a data tech. So he's working with the database manager. So um, they wanted somebody who could think critically, and he proved to them in an interview setting that he could. Um, and we have another woman who is, um, her name is Grace, and she um, she was our first mentee, and she didn't get a job with Elixir. She got a job with writing Ruby tests, and she'll be writing Clojure soon, right? So, um, but I do believe that, um, that if you want to work in the world market, which I think that you as an Elixir users group should basically, um, you guys should start growing your skills in that way, in that um, that we're going to be good Elixir developers. We're going to invite the best minds from around the world to come and talk with you, and they will. Um, and, and then we're going to, um, if the jobs aren't in Kenya, we're going to find the jobs where they are. But I bet you will find that if you can say with authority, that we can build your system in um, X dollars in Java or X divided by five dollars in Elixir, you'll get people to listen. Wow, nice. Uh, that's very nice <laughs> and encouraging, actually. So we we just need the pipeline to find those who we can tell that. Um, it's kind of a blocked world uh, sometimes. So we're not really able to get, because we've done Elixir for quite some time. Uh, personally, I've done it for about two years. So uh, yeah, and um, I've done it almost every day. We've built for some clients over here in Kenya. Um, but when I say it's hard to get a job, it's because there are very few companies that will allow you to use Elixir. Secondly, very few companies that will employ you if you're skilled with Elixir. Yeah, so I think that probably um, probably you do two things. Yeah. One, you look you look for jobs on the world market. So you so elixir skills are in demand, right? And you have a benefit that's also a bit of a curse, right? The benefit is that you are on. Um, you said that that the dollar is too strong to afford books, right? You can use that to your advantage as well. Um, so. If you have if you have skills that that you can go apply elsewhere, um, don't be afraid to apply them elsewhere. 
but you shouldn't run away from the idea that that IT managers are IT managers. And if you can if you can talk not in terms of programming language, but in terms of business value, right? In terms of the value of um, you know, if 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 you're gonna sell aren't these pipes cool, you're going to lose, right? But if you mm-hmm. sell the idea that I am going to write a Twitter demo for you in 15 minutes. Now, show me the best that you can do with a Java JavaScript solution. Yeah. Then you're starting to talk in terms of time, right? And okay. you're starting to talk. And then you could say, hey, well, um, so what about reliability? Look at this OTP thing. Look at the reliability. There are OTP systems that haven't gone down in years. So what reliability have you achieved? Right? Now you're starting to talk into the language of somebody who will um, who will at least listen to you. And don't take on the biggest service um, in the room, right? So take on um, a small service, um, something like, like, for example, in Pinterest, Elixir is in there. And they're in there is a proxy, right? A proxy that does some fraud, uh, fraud detection. Um, but it's a super high volume, super high traffic, super distributed, very concurrent part of the system where they can, they have one tenth of the servers that they had. Bleacher Report is, um, was also very much the same way. Um, you could see, so if you pick up the book Adopting Elixir, I bet we can get a, we can get, we can find a copy. Um, let me see if I can. If I can find a copy, or you know, pull pull your resources um, and you know, work with other people to get a copy of that book, and and just kind of read about um, about what's happened. And um, you know, if anybody asks you about the license agreement, um, you know, I, I'll be the um, I'll be your um, your champion. And and tell them they said Bruce said it was okay. I was one of the authors. <laughs> Uh, there's another question in the chat. What's a reasonable hourly rate for a developer in Kenya asking from Germany? And I don't know. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to basically try. Uh, sorry, that was a question for the community here because I'm wondering. I'm I'm sitting here in Germany, and I think uh, I just figured out that we have only an hour of time difference. So uh, the whole. Um, value thing you're talking about of a developer is highly dependent on where you're sitting so there's a big chance of remote hiring especially in these times look i'm a i'm an it manager and my whole team is in in home quarantine right now so i don't even care where they sit so this is a big uh big chance right now and sometimes if you go to india you really have a language barrier that you don't have in this room um everyone here has impeccable English and um, you're obviously well studied students um, yeah that's um, and that's fantastic okay uh, so uh, I am I really in a position to respond to this uh, the reasonable hourly rate um, can I just do some quick math then I'll respond sure. to that yeah sure And so I have the time for one more question. Which one should we choose? Let's see. Developers to write Elixir. Interesting. Look outside Kenya. Absolutely. What is a reasonable hourly rate? Real-time payments is a big example of an area that can make use of Elixir and OTP. Absolutely. Real-time payments. Um, you know, I have a payment gateway that I, um, I write on Groxio. And it took me a long time to write, but it's extraordinarily reliable. Um, and I can roll it up to the reporting. Um, I would really say that um, if you are interested in staying on the razor's edge, I would look into um, into nerves, um, which is it's going to be it's going to take a little bit more time to build that experience. But you know, quite frankly, it won't take a good elixir developer very long to learn live view, right? And um, you know, even though it's not with the most current version of LiveView, it still teaches the LiveView concepts. Um, you can look at the Tetris video series. I think it's only 10, um, 10 bucks US, which granted is much more in Kenya, but it should be much more affordable as well. Um, and, and maybe if, if you guys decide to, um, to buy 
um, as a group, um, we can work out a group discount for you on that product. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, you need 3D securing your website tonight. Yeah, <laughs> Graxio does not have 3D secure yet, and um, and frankly, um, there are um, it, it's difficult enough to um, implement um, all of the different um, payment scenarios that um, we're not going to, we're not going to add um, 3D Secure anytime soon. So sad face, can't do it. Okay, let's see. What's a reasonable hourly rate developer? Okay, from USD nine, depending on experience levels. Yeah, yeah don't, don't hmm. quote him that nine dollar rate. You can <laughs> ask for much more and still be a very, very reasonable developer. Yeah. So that was a math mistake. What he really meant was thirty dollars US. <laughs> 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 You're still, gosh, you're still like a like a, a fourth or a fifth of, gosh, that that would be cheap for India. You can do better than yeah. that. Wait, yeah. let me do the math again. I'll, I'll just do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. There you go. There you go. Let me let me do it again. Yeah, delete that. Right. Delete that. Yeah. Undo the conversions again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Remove. All right. Um, I think that's pretty much it. That's all. That's all the time I've got. But wow, this was so much fun, and we have to do this again. I would love to come talk with you in two to three months' time um, on a topic called joy, um, which is basically um, more about the soft skills of programming. And I think it's. Um, you know, whether or not we're still, it's, it's especially valuable during this, this time of the global pandemic. But, you know, regardless, in the developing world, um, what I would suggest is please, please, please don't try to take Western values as you decide to build your, your career. Um, it's not all about money. Um, it's, it's about finding personal joy and passion. Um, and I'd love to come to talk to you about that topic, um, if that's interesting to you. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. I don't know, Chantel seems to have left, but yeah, that's a really interesting topic. So we can schedule another webinar again. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah okay. Just just in case, where I hope you use the, the the form we filled out to reach us in case we missed out the new public the, the new notification for the next. Uh, the talk with with Bruce. All right. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, we'll use that and send you emails. Um, yes, this exactly. And also give you uh, information about the next webinar. Very well, very well. Good one. Yeah. Good one. Thank Wonderful. You guys. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I've I've enjoyed meeting with you tremendously. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.